Hey everybody, welcome back to General Biochemistry Lecture. We're in chapter 19, which is on oxidative phosphorylation. In your textbook, we kind of skip over chapter 17 and 18, but don't worry, we'll be back for those. It makes more sense to talk about the citric acid cycle and then get to oxidative phosphorylation because they're linked. Then we'll kind of loop back around. So that's the, the road map for what's coming ahead. Right now, we're going to dive into chapter 19. As usual, these are the key principles for the chapter. Make sure that they make sense. You can expound upon them after listening to this lecture and reviewing your notes. Oxidative phosphorylation is hinged on what's called the chemiosmotic theory. And this means that there's a difference in the potential across the membrane of the mitochondria in this case. And that difference is caused by protein, proton concentration being high on one side and low on the other. And this difference in concentration serves as a reservoir for the energy that's extracted from biological oxidation reactions. What you can see here on this slide that is very overly simplified these are the complexes involved in the respiratory chain, which are linked to ATP synthase. That's where the majority of ATP that's synthesized is actually synthesized in the cell. In general, there's a reduced substrate that donates electrons. And the electron carriers, which are part of the respiratory chain, pump hydrogen out as electrons flow, ultimately landing with oxygen, molecular oxygen, which is the ultimate electron acceptor. In doing so, we split oxygen and make water. All of the energy of the flow of electrons is stored as electrochemical potential. And that potential is what ATP synthase uses to synthesize ATP. So we're gonna go over all of these um, pieces in more detail in this chapter. Let's start with the respiratory chain, which you may have seen called the electron transport chain, the ETC, same thing. Just to refresh your memory about mitochondria, they have two membranes. There's an outer membrane that is readily permeable to small molecules and ions. Transport occurs through what's called porins. Then there's an inner membrane that is impermeable. So you can't just get all the way through the mitochondria. That inner membrane has specific transporters for different molecules. In between the outer membrane and the inner membrane is what's called the intermembrane space. And within that space is where ions and intermediates like to hang out before they are shuttled back and forth or they go through their transporter or what have you to get to the matrix. I'm going to say matrix a lot of times during this video. And if you're anything like me, you're going to be thinking about the movie The Matrix and Keanu Reeves and how the first movie was okay for the 90s, and then it just got worse and terrible after that. I'm going to mention Keanu Reeves and the Matrix movies again at least one more time. I apologize. I can't help it. Every time I mention the mitochondria and I think about the Matrix, it's ingrained in my brain. Sorry. Anyway, the Matrix is where a lot of different proteins that we've already talked about, like the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, citric acid cycle enzymes, lots of things live there. This slide just kind of summarizes what we're talking about in terms of the mitochondrial matrix and also the inner mitochondrial membrane and what its purpose is in terms of segregating the things that are in the cytosol that can freely move back and forth across that outer membrane and the matrix. So it separates those two things. Mitochondria 
can undergo stress just like everything else in the cell. And when stress conditions occur, it can cause them to split, which is called fission, or it can cause mitophagy. And that's breaking down the mitochondria to recycle all of their good bits, the amino acids, the nucleotides, the lipids. As the stress is relieved, then you can reform your mitochondria and the small mitochondria can fuse together to make longer um, thin tubular organelles. The respiratory chain is just the series of electron carriers. Again, it's the same thing as the electron transport chain or ETC. You may have seen it termed that in biology books. Same thing. Through our walk through metabolic pathways, we've encountered a lot of dehydrogenases. These enzymes collect electrons from all the catabolic pathways and funnel them into the universal electron acceptors, the nicotinamide nucleotides and the flavin nucleotides. In general, the nicotinamide nucleotide linked dehydrogenases catalyze reversible reactions with these two general schemes. You have a reduced substrate and NAD or NADP. You form an oxidized substrate which has given its electrons to the NAD or the NADP to form NADH or NADPH. Those electrons can then be shuttled to another substrate or they could be moved to the respiratory chain. So you're gonna transfer a hydride, which has two electrons, and you also release a proton into the medium. This table has some important reactions that are catalyzed by dehydrogenases that use NAD or NADP. We've already talked about a lot of these. Some of them we will cover in later chapters. No need to memorize this table. This just gives you an idea of all the different types of chemistry that goes on with these dehydrogenases and where they're located, whether it's in the mitochondria or in the cytosol. Flavoproteins, we haven't talked a lot about those. They do a lot of redox chemistry and we're not focusing on that too heavily in this class. But they're very unique in that they contain a very tightly and sometimes covalently bound flavin nucleotide. And the characteristics of the nucleotide is very much influenced by the residues surrounding the nucleotide. So it's not like NAD or NADP where the characteristics of the molecule are pretty stable, but these are actually influenced by what's around them. So the protein influences the characteristics of the flavonucleotide. The good thing about flavonucleotides is that they can actually do one or two electron chemistry. So they're more versatile. There's three types of electron transfers that occur in oxidative phosphorylation. We've got the direct transfer of electrons, We've got the transfer as a hydrogen atom, so a proton and an electron. And we've also got transfers using hydride ions, which is two electrons. Throughout your book, and even in some of the questions from the textbook, you may see the term reducing equivalent. All that means is we're looking at a single electron being transferred in a redox reaction. So just keep that in mind. We've already talked about NAD and flavoproteins, but there are three additional types of electron carrying molecules that we need to cover so that we can dive into oxidative phosphorylation. The first is ubiquinone, also known as coenzyme Q or Q. I am prone to calling it CoQ because I have to be original. And it's just kind of a reminder, it's a coenzyme. And what it is, is a lipid soluble benzoquinone with a long isoprenoid chain. 
So this is the benzoquinone part. This is the isoprenoid part. And this molecule can accept one or two electrons and it freely diffuses within the inner mitochondrial membrane. So it can go between the different complexes in the respiratory chain and we'll see how important that is coming up. But this, this molecule plays a central role in coupling electron flow to proton movement. On the right, you'll see how the electrons can get added to the um, benzoquinone portion. Not requiring you to know that, but if you're interested in the chemistry, there it is. The next type, we have cytochromes. And these are proteins that have characteristic strong absorption of visible light because they have an iron-containing heme group. Cytochromes carry one electron, and there's three different classes in mitochondria, A, B, and C. Don't worry about knowing the difference between A, B, and C, but I have it here for you. So the heme groups of A and B are not covalently bound. So they are free to move about the cabin. They can leave, they can come back. However, cytochrome C has its heme group covalently attached through cysteine residues. So that's the main difference between A and B versus C with the cytochromes. We're going to see cytochrome C towards the end of the lecture too, towards the end of the chapter. It actually moonlights and has another function with mitochondria. This is what the prosthetic groups of cytochromes looks like. We've got type B, type C, and type A. And then we have their absorption spectra. Again, this is purely for your enjoyment and your knowledge. You do not need to memorize these structures or their absorption spectra. Then we have iron sulfur proteins. Iron sulfur proteins have an iron that's associated with inorganic sulfur atoms or they're associated with the sulfur that's part of a cysteine residue in a protein. And they participate in one electron transfers. There's also the RISC iron sulfur proteins named for the person who did a lot of work studying these. And these are proteins where you have an iron that's coordinated with two histidine residues. And if you think about it, you can think of an example of an iron atom that's coordinated with two histidines, hemoglobin. It binds a heme group, and that's how it's coordinated, the proximal and the distal uh, histidines. I know, full circle. You're welcome. We're talking about the respiratory chain, the electron chain. Mm, my tongue did not want to work. The electron transport chain. It's a tongue twister. And there's an order to how the electrons move through the complexes involved. And each of the complexes utilizes these um, different electron carriers. So it can either donate electrons to CoQ or there are cytochromes or there are iron sulfur center proteins present in the you know, in the complex. But you have to figure out how the electrons are flowing to ultimately end up splitting molecular oxygen. I don't want you to know the exact details of the methodology, but I want you to understand the logic behind how these experiments work. So each individual electron carrier has its own standard reduction potential. That's this E here. And what they did, there are several groups who worked on this, but the idea is the same. You reduce the entire chain of carriers, but you do so without oxygen present. So everything is loaded with electrons and ready to transfer electrons to the next step. Then you introduce oxygen 
and you measure the rate that each electron carrier loses its electrons. The carrier that's closest to oxygen, meaning that it transfers directly to oxygen, should lose its electrons first. Then the one that's second closest to oxygen will lose its electrons and so on and so forth. And if you're careful, you can keep track of the electrons to see the rates and when they increase and who dona donates their electrons when to piece together the order. Again, several groups did this and they also used inhibitors to affect electron transfer so that you have a place like, okay, I know that electron transfer can't happen from this point to this point. Now I'm going to preload everything and see what it looks like. And then you put all those pieces together to figure out the order. Different inhibitors, for example, antibiotics. There are also some small molecule inhibitors. Stop electron transfer at different places. And by putting all of those pieces together, you can put together the order of electron um, transfer. This table has all the standard reduction potentials of the different parts of the respiratory chain and the related electron carriers. You don't need to know this table whatsoever, but understand that electrons will flow spontaneously from carriers of lower um, reduction potential to higher reduction potential. So this is the order of the carriers, starting with NADH, and then transfer to Q and so on and so forth. This order has been confirmed by all the different approaches. So using, you know, different inhibitors and things of that nature. There's more detail about the experiments, the exact experiments that were done to figure out this order. If you're interested in that, by all means, dive in in the textbook. But again, I'm not requiring you to know the specific methodology and all the nitty gritty details of each experiment. Just understand the logic. So there are four unique electron carrier complexes that catalyze electron transfer through a portion of the chain. We've got complex one, two, three, and four, and we're gonna talk about each of them in turn. I want you to have an appreciation for just how large these complexes are. Complex one is 850 kilodaltons. That's 850,000 Daltons. That is huge. There are 45 subunits. There's all types of prosthetic groups. These are very massive complexes just to move teeny tiny electrons. But because these electrons can do such havoc if they're, you know, let loose, you have to have a lot of coordination and guidance to make sure that the electrons get where you want them to be. So if you want to study this in the lab, you have to have a way of isolating these complexes. We're not going to go too deep into the exact procedure, but again, I want you to have an idea of the logic behind isolating these complexes. First thing you have to do is isolate mitochondria. So you grow up cells, you lyse them, and you can separate the different organelles. Once you have mitochondria, you can treat with digitonin. Digitonin is a mild detergent that's going to break up the outer membrane into fragments, and you can just discard those because you don't want them. You're left with the inner membrane fragments which has all of the complexes that you're interested in, and it also has the ATP synthase. We're gonna talk about that after we finish talking about the complexes. You can use what's called osmotic rupture, which pretty much means that you are changing pH and salt concentrations 
to gently break apart the inner membrane into small fragments. Then you can solubilize these small fragments with detergent and use ion exchange to isolate the different complexes 1, 2, 3, 4 in ATP synthase. You can actually look at the different reactions in the different fractions of the complexes that you fractionate in vitro. And again, in vitro just means on the bench top. Let's dive into complex one. Complex one, which is also called a ubiquinone oxidoreductase. I'm not gonna bother with these long names. However, they are here and you should at least recognize them. But again, I'm gonna stick with complex one, two, three, four, just because it's a lot simpler to say and easier to type and write. It's got a large L shape, more than 40 polypeptide chains, so it is huge. It's got FMN containing uh, flavor proteins and it accepts two electrons from NADH. There are also iron sulfur centers that are involved in passing that, those two electrons from complex one to coenzyme Q. While this is happening, we've also got some proton pumping going on. So the movement of those two electrons is associated with pumping four protons into the inner membrane space. The inner membrane space is also called the P side because it is positively charged. I sometimes have a hard time remembering that. So the way that I remember the P side is the inner membrane space. Space has a P. So inner membrane space is the P side, which is positive. If you can remember that, then the other side is the matrix side, which is negatively charged. You'll see that terminology throughout this chapter. So what have we done so far? We've got complex one. We've gotten two electrons from NADH and passed them on to CoQ, which can hang out in that inner membrane and it can go between the complexes to deliver electrons. Complex one catalyzes two things at the same time. The transfer of the hydride from NADH to CoQ and pumping protons. Pumping those protons is endergonic because there's already a high positive charge to the you know on the inner membrane space side so you're trying to add more positive charge to something that's already positively charged not exactly the most energy efficient process but the movement of those electrons is highly exergonic and that enables the pumping to occur this proton pumping is necessary to maintain the difference in charge so that ultimately down the line, the ATP synthase has the power to make ATP and release it. You'll also see this process called a vectorial reaction, which means that it's moving protons in a specific direction from one location to the other. It's pumping from the matrix into the inner membrane space. It's not going to happen the other way around. Here's the overall reaction, which you do not need to memorize. But I will indicate that we are stressing the fact that we're moving electrons from the N side, the matrix, to the P side. There are plenty of agents that inhibit oxidative phosphorylation, and here are some inhibitors of complex one. No need to memorize these, 
but understand that if you use these, you can inhibit part or all of the electron transport chain. And you can think about how that would affect the cell if you no longer have the ability to move electrons through the electron transport chain and ultimately make ATP. It's great fodder for exam questions. Just a heads up. Now we're on to complex two. Complex two is also known as succinate dehydrogenase. That name should be very familiar because it's part of the citric acid cycle. So during the day, it will convert succinate to fumarate. And then its night job is passing electrons to CoQ. It's not exactly day and night, but it has two functions. So we're coupling the oxidation of succinate with the reduction of CoQ. Electrons are going to pass from the FAD, which is also um, one of the coenzymes, to sulfur, iron sulfur centers, and then to CoQ. There's no proton pumping here. Succinate dehydrogenase already does enough. Look, I already catalyzed a chemical reaction and I'm gonna transfer these electrons. You want me to pump a, a proton too? Look, I'm gonna need some overtime. You need to pay me time and a half. So complex two is not worried about prump, pumping any protons. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about heme B. Heme B is a part of complex two, AKA succinate dehydrogenase. And its purpose is to reduce the frequency that we have electrons leaking out of the system, meaning that they leave, you know, where they're supposed to be and move from succinate directly to molecular oxygen to produce what's called reactive oxygen species or ROS. That could be hydrogen peroxide or superoxide radicals. Heme B reduces the frequency of this occurring. It still happens, but it reduces the frequency. We'll talk a little bit later about why that's bad and some of the other things that the cell has to mitigate that. Complex three. If you haven't noticed the trend, again, these complexes are huge. Many, many subunits lots of coenzymes, prosthetic groups, all the things, just to shuttle some teeny tiny little electrons. I just think that that's highly ironic and maybe it seems wasteful, but the destructive power, the destructive power of electrons is so great that going through all of these great lengths to contain them and shuttle them appropriately is highly necessary. So again, complex three now. This is using more cytochromes and we are transferring two electrons from ubiquinol, so that CoQ, to cytochrome C. This one is a proton pump. So we're pumping some, elec some not electrons, we're pumping some protons along with electron flow. That CoQ diffuses through the inner mitochondrial membrane and it transfers electrons that come from complex one and complex two to complex three. The electrons are transferred to cytochrome B and then the electrons pass through an iron sulfur center and you're passing those electrons one at a time because that's all they can do to cytochrome C. So this kind of, this figure shows you visually what's going on. We've got CoQ, which has some electrons. Giving up those electrons and eventually 
those electrons get to cytochrome C. We can also have what's kind of called the Q cycle. So you'll notice that there's kind of like two Qs shown here. We can have one electron kind of going up here and getting shuttled via cytochrome C and another electron reducing another Q. We can only move one electron at a time when we're talking about these iron sulfur clusters. Now we've got cytochrome C holding on to an electron and it's going to transfer that electron to molecular oxygen via complex four. Cytochrome C can actually move in the inner membrane space. So it, like CoQ, is free to move about the cabin. Complex four is a large dimeric enzyme and three of its subunits have been conserved through evolution. So clearly they are efficient at doing what they do and very important. We're also seeing the appearance of cytochromes A and A3. And we also see a rare occurrence of a metal other than the normal ones like magnesium and zinc and calcium. We see copper. This makes sense because copper is actually really good at conducting electricity. And if you have anything electronic, which you're listening to this lecture, which means you've got a phone or a laptop or a tablet or something that you charge, you're very familiar with electricity. The wires in your home have copper cores because copper is a great conductor. What is electricity? It's the flow of electrons. So using something that's really good at flowing electrons makes sense here. I know these two worlds are combining physics, and chemistry and biology. So really three worlds are combining here to just make a mind boggling experience. Sciences really are related y'all. So now we're gonna move on to talking about cytochrome C a little bit. I already told you it moves through the inner membrane space. It goes between complex three and complex four and it carries a single electron. Since it's a cytochrome, it also absorbs visible light. And again, this is the structure which you are by no means responsible for. This figure shows you the path of electrons through complex four. You're not required to know the individual, okay, it goes to, you know, this heme, it's oxidized here, reduced there. No, you don't need to know that. You just need to know in general that one, you've got some protons being pumped from the matrix to the inner membrane space. So complex four is a pump. You've got the movement of electrons from the cytochrome C, which is in the inner membrane space, to complex four, travels through all of the, you know, cytochromes and the um, iron sulfur proteins and eventually merges with that molecular oxygen because remember complex four is an enzyme you're going to split that oxygen and create water all of these complexes one three and four they're in something called a super complex that's the respirosome. And the thought behind this is that perhaps this facilitates electron transfer, or maybe it helps to limit Ross production. Remember, if you've got electrons that are just free to roam about the cabin, you can do a lot of damage to the cell. Also notice that complex two is not a part of this respirosome. Complex two is a part of the citric acid cycle. And in order to receive the intermediate it needs to receive to then 
take succinate and perform chemistry to form fumarate, it needs to be with the citric acid cycle enzymes. So that is its day job, you know. Cytochrome C and ubiquinone, that CoQ, readily diffuse between super complexes. So all of the CoQs and all of the cytochrome Cs can go to, you know, from one respirosome to the other, finding a place to deliver their electrons so that there's no delay. Other pathways can donate their electrons to the, resp um, the respiratory chain via ubiquinone. We're not going to go too deep into the detail of exactly which pathways, but I do want you to understand that this occurs. And if you think about it, it makes sense. There are lots of catabolic processes going on that generate NADH, FADH2, etc. We need a way to get those electrons to the electron transport chain. So there has to be some kind of mechanisms to funnel these electrons through the respiratory chain. This is just a summary of the flow of electrons and protons through the respiratory chain. Much of the free energy that's generated by all of this electron movement is stored in the form of electrochemical proton gradient. Remember that we've got the matrix side which is negatively charged in the inner membrane space, that membrane side is positively charged. Having that difference in charge across the membrane creates electrochemical potential energy. That energy is also called the proton motive force. This is the energy that's stored in that proton gradient across the inner membrane. It's composed of chemical and electrical potential energy. Like I alluded to earlier, reactive oxygen species, or ROS, they're generated during oxidative phosphorylation, which is this whole process of the electron transport chain and ATP synthesis. We have some things in place to make sure that all that ROS isn't just going around and wrecking havoc on the cell. There's superoxide dismutase, which catalyzes the conversion of superoxide to hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. This oxygen we can use, and the, the hydrogen peroxide can be converted to water using glutathione peroxidase. There are some low levels of ROS in the cell. And what that can do is signal, hey, we don't have enough oxygen. So a low level of ROS is tolerated as a signal. But that's about it. You don't need to know the details of glutathione peroxidase or superoxide dismutase. Just know what their functions are. So we've covered the respiratory chain, but we still haven't covered how we actually make ATP. That's what we're going to do in this chapter, or not chapter, this section of the chapter. Some of these sections are big enough to feel like chapters on their own. Let's just be honest. We're gonna go back to that chemiosmotic model, and this describes the coupling of ATP synthesis to electrochemical potential gradient, the proton motive force. So these two things are coupled. They need each other to survive. You create that proton gradient and the energy from that facilitates ATP synthesis. ATP synthase is the complex that is responsible for making a lot of ATP. What happens is there's a core 
or a pore in the core. Say that three times fast. There's a pore in the core of ATP synthase that allows protons to passively flow from the inner membrane space back down into the matrix. There's a lot of energy involved in that because it is very highly favorable. And that energy is used to catalyze making ATP and releasing that ATP from the ATP synthase. The overall equation is here for how that's made. And again, no need to memorize it, but the emphasis is on the fact that we are moving protons this, this time from the inner membrane space to the matrix. There are inhibitors that can um, inhibit electron transfer, which also block ATP synthesis. And likewise, the reverse is true. If you inhibit ATP synthesis, you will also block electron transfer unless you have uncoupled these two processes. You don't need to understand the mechanics of how to do this experiment, but understand that if you inhibit one, the other one will be affected. So these are the some chemical uncouplers of oxidative phosphorylation. And w again, what that means is the generation of ATP is separate from the movement of electrons and the pumping of protons across the gradient. Dinitrophenol or DNP and FCCP are weak acids. The red H tells you the acidic um, hydrogen, so that's the proton that's removed. And these acids can actually go across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Once they get there, the conditions are such that they're gonna release that proton. That destroys the gradient. So once you do that, then you've uncoupled um, these two processes. You can also use detergent or you can physically shear um, the complexes in such a way that you disturb the proton gradient. There's another experiment that's described in your book in, in pretty good detail. I'm not going to have you be responsible for the details of the experiment. But I want you to understand, again, the logic behind it. The set of experiments that were done prove that the proton motive force alone drives ATP synthesis. If you have the ATPase and you don't have an oxidizable substrate, you can actually create a proton motive force using differences in pH and differences in salt ion concentrations. And if you can recreate the differential um, charge on either side of the membrane, then that is enough to give ATP synthase the energy to convert ADP and inorganic phosphate to ATP and release it in solution. So all it needs is that difference in electrochemical potential. Let's talk more about the characteristics of ATP synthase. It's got two functional domains, FO and F1. This is the letter O, not a zero. FO is for, um, it's what, oligomycin resistant. Don't quote me on the antibiotic, but it's a particular antibiotic that the F0 uh, domain is 
sensitive to. And so that's where its name comes from. So that's a zero. That's not a zero. It is the letter O. Mitochondrial ATP synthase is a, an F-type ATPase. There are others. It's very similar in structure and mechanism to ATP synthases of bacteria and chloroplasts. And we'll actually take a very short look at bacterial ATP synthesis. The two distinct components here are F0, which is the integral membrane protein that has a proton pore. And that's where the hydrogen, the proton, will go from the inner membrane space, fall back into the matrix. Man, the matrix again. Anywho. Then there's the F1, which was originally termed the F1 ATPase because it can catalyze the forward and reverse reaction. So it can make ATP. It can also hydrolyze ATP to give you ADP and inorganic phosphate. This portion is a peripheral membrane protein. And what that means, the peripheral part, is that it associates with one side of the membrane. It does not span the membrane. It just hangs out and sticks to one side. So ATP is stabilized relative to the ADP on the surface of the F1 part, the catalytic portion. So on the surface, without the cellular conditions, quite honestly, this reaction is readily reversible. There's no reason for it to stay as ATP in water, it'll just go back and forth all day long, no problem. So there are some structural characteristics of ATP synthase that stabilize the ATP and allow for that to be the predominant um, you know, direction that the reaction goes in. ATP actually binds more tightly and that releases enough energy to counterbalance the cost of making the ATP and keeping it there. So this is a look at the free energy required for the release of ATP. And this energy is provided by the proton motive force. So a typical enzyme, you'd have your enzyme and substrate come together. There's some kind of uh, activation energy in terms of forming the ES complex. Once that happens, you get over the energy hump, you make your product. Great day. With ATP synthase, our substrates have pretty much there's like no energy really required, very minimal energy in terms of the actual reaction of ADP plus the phosphate yielding ATP. So it can kind of go back and forth all day long. The hard part is getting that ATP to be released into solution. That is where the energy of the proton motive force allows for the release of ATP from ATP synthase in the cell. This is a very, very, very large complex. Cannot stress that enough. When we look at uh, some figures that have the entire complex, you'll realize just how big this thing is. So the F1 has several different um, domains. And one of those domains is the beta domain. It's got three beta subunits. And this is where the actual chemistry happens. So these are hold the catalytic sites for ATP synthesis. Even though they are identical, each of the subunits is in a different conformation. So we've got one subunit that has ATP bound, another subunit that has ADP bound, and another subunit that is completely empty. And all three of these have different conformations. If we're looking at a top view of F1, we've got in purple all of the beta subunits. 
one with a DP, one with a TP, which is kind of buried in here from this view, and one that's totally empty. In between that, you've got alpha subunits. Now we'll look at some of the pertinent structures that are part of the F, the FO complex. You're not going to be responsible for knowing all of the things that comprise the F1 and the FO, but you will need to know the kind of the, the big players. So the beta subunit from the F1, you'll need to know that and kind of the information about how that works and the binding and the different conformations. For the FO, the composition, it's got A, B, and C subunits. And the C subunits are the ones that we're going to focus on because they are key to the actual release of ATP. The number of C subunits ranges depending on the species. But in all the species that have this, all the C's come together to form a C ring, which is just two concentric circles. And they actually rotate together as a unit. This is the structure looking at both of these domains together. On the left side, we're looking at the yeast mitochondrial ATP synthase. And in yeast, there are 10 such C subunits that form the C ring. The C ring actually rotates and it's connected to the A subunit of the FO. On the end side, remember this is the, in the matrix side, you have the F1, which has all the catalytic sites in the beta subunits. We have the pump, once well, it's not a pump, there's a pore for protons to passively go through to go from the positive side to the matrix. And the energy released from that provides the energy for the C ring to actually rotate. We're going to talk about all this in the upcoming slides, but I'm just prefacing all of these things so that when you hear it again, hopefully you'll be ready to receive it. On the right hand side, we've got a, a side view of the entire complex. I can't stress to you em enough how huge this thing is. This here is the C ring. And the purple, again, the purple are the beta subunits. Rotational catalysis is actually the key to the changing and confirmation of the beta subunits. Rotational catalysis is the mechanism by which the flow of protons actually causes the F0 um, C ring to rotate. And that rotation triggers the subunit conformational changes in F1. what's called the binding change model is just saying that the active site of each beta subunit cycles through each of the three conformations and that is coupled with the rotation of the C ring. So when a subunit has ATP bound it's called the tight binding. So it tightly binds ATP. When there's ADP then it's loose binding. So you can have that reversible reaction going on. You're making ATP, you're hydrolyzing it, making it, hydrolyzing it. And then empty, very loose binding. So we didn't even have any substrate bound. It can bind, but it'll just kind of fall off, bind, fall off. 
not really primed to do any chemistry, not really primed to even hold on to its substrates. The active sites take turns catalyzing ATP synthesis. And along with that catalysis, we're translocating three protons so for every one ATP that we make, we require three protons to be pumped through. I say pumped, it's not really pumped. They flow passively. When we're talking about mitochondria, you have to be careful about whether or not you use pump versus passive because they really do mean two different things. Each complete rotation synthesizes three ATPs. So if we're looking at, if that's a C ring and we're focused on say this particular C subunit, we would have to see this unit go all the way around and end up back in its position, the starting position that would indicate a one complete rotation and we will have made three ATPs. So if one complete rotation is synonymous with synthesizing three ATPs, then that means you require nine protons to be translocated to make this happen. So the proton translocation causes the rotation of that FO domain. That triggers the conformational change within all three of those, the beta subunits, which are paired with the alpha in the F1. And the conformational change, one of those promotes the condensation of ADP with inorganic phosphate into ATP. Once that ATP is formed, it binds tightly to the beta subunit. The gamma subunit rotates in one direction when we're synthesizing ATP and the opposite direction when you're hydrolyzing ATP. Obviously, we're trying to synthesize ATP so that it can be released. So we're going to move in that one direction. And there are some experiments done to provide evidence for this theory. There are a couple of different groups working on this. Again, you don't need to know the details, the nitty gritty details of the experiments, but understand the logic behind it. So some clever folks decided, you know, I'm going to take advantage of the very tight binding pair of avidin and biotin. I'm going to attach an actin filament to avidin and have biotin attached to the C ring. So all those C subunits. Then we have something that we can watch the position of because actin filaments you can see using cryo EM or just some kind of um, electron microscopy. And you can track where that actin filament is pointing. And you can track therefore the direction of the turning of that C ring. This corresponds to the movement of the gamma subunit. So they both rotate in the same direction. And this answers the question of, if we have rotation, which way is it rotating and which way is what's necessary to actually synthesize ATP? And one of the observations that was made is that the actin filament, it was never a smooth, you know, you can see the actin filament at every angle, 
but there are specific angles, specific positions of that actin filament showing that there is a specific amount of degrees that's rotated for each turn. I think these were some really elegant experiments. It just shows the power of biochemistry and using all of the things that we know about biology and chemistry and physics to interrogate a system that is super complicated and highly, highly critical for our survival. So here's the model for a proton-driven rotation of the C-ring. The A subunit is stationary. And within that, the C-ring kind of sits in it. So there's the A subunit. And then the C-ring. I can't draw, y'all. You know this. That is next to it. The A-ring is stationary. The C ring rotates. There's a glutamate residue in each C subunit. And when it's protonated, just transiently, there's a conformational change that drives rotation and allows for protons to flow through. Here's a look at a couple of different species and their O-rings. So this species has 13 C subunits. This one has 14. But they all look pretty similar, right? The two concentric circles is just a matter of how many of those C, C subunits are there. So the ATPase or the ATP synthase needs a couple of helpers. We have some translocases involved in active transport of molecules that are critical for ATP synthase operation. The first is adenine nucleotide translocase, and this is an antiporter that moves ADP into the matrix and it moves ATP out of the matrix. An antiporter is just something that moves one molecule in one direction and another molecule in the opposite direction. We obviously need ADP in the matrix so that it can react with phosphate to make ATP. Once that ATP is made, we don't want to just keep it all in the mitochondria. It needs to get out to the cytosol so that other enzymes that require ATP and other processes that require ATP have a constant pool of ATP to pull from. There's also a phosphate translocase, and that promotes the symport of phosphate, and you're also bringing in a proton. It brings both of those things into the matrix. So we bring in the substrates necessary for ATP synthesis, and we actively remove the product ATP. The translocases plus the ATP synthase together are called the ATP synthesome. So all of the components necessary to drive ATP synthesis and get the substrates to the active sites and get the product out. So there are other places where NADH is made, right? Think about all of the reactions in glycolysis, lots of other reactions going on in the cytosol. How do we get all those electrons to the respiratory chain? Well, if you thought to yourself, well, why can't we just have the NADH just go in there? Well, you can't. The inner membrane is impermeable to NADH and NAD. And if we really think about it, that makes sense. Because NADH and NAD regulate processes that go on in the mitochondria. And we don't want the mixing of these two pools because then you may have um, a false signal. So let's say that you have 
intermingling of the NADH from the cytosol with the NADH in the mitochondrial matrix. NADH can signal to the citric acid cycle, hey, we're good here. We don't need any more ATP made. So you need to stop cranking through the citric acid cycle, stop making NADH, because we don't need any more electrons shuttled through the respiratory chain. That may not actually be the case. So the mitochondria is very sensitive to the ratio of NADH and NAD. And if you added in the cytosolic com components, it could throw everything off. So instead, we have to have a method to move NADH equivalents from the cytosol to the matrix. And those two systems are the malate aspartate shuttle and the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. We'll go over the malate aspartate shuttle first. We've heard of malate, we've heard of aspartate. Malate, that's something that's made during the citric acid cycle. Aspartate, that's an amino acid. How are they related? Well, let's see. Malate dehydrogenase. We've heard that enzyme before. It's a part of the citric acid cycle. Gee, lots of these enzymes have lots of other jobs besides the one that we're told about. Good observation. Oftentimes, moonlighting is a thing. We can't have one protein or one enzyme for every single process that goes on. That'd be exhausting. So we have NADH that's in the intermembrane space. It can't cross the inner membrane to get to the matrix. So everything from the cytosol, it can come through and hang out in the inner membrane space but it cannot cross over. Thankfully, malate dehydrogenase is here and it will take the electrons from NADH, add it to oxaloacetate to form malate. Once malate is formed, it can travel through the malate alpha ketoglutarate transporter which is in the inner membrane. Once that happens, there's malate dehydrogenase that's on the matrix side that can do the reverse. Take NAD and remove a hydride and a proton to make NADH and reform the oxaloacetate. That oxaloacetate can then be converted to aspartate using aspartate amino transferase. We have not covered amino acid catabolism yet, but we will talk about some of these different processes and we'll be talking about amino transferases as well. So don't get too caught up in that. But once you form oxaloacetate, or once you form aspartate, then that aspartate can then travel through the glutamate aspartate transporter, which is also in the inner membrane. And that aspartate can undergo the same reaction, only in the reverse, with the amino transferase to reform oxaloacetate. And you can do the same shuttling over and over again. So we started with this NADH in the inner membrane space. We transferred those electrons to malate, and then we got them back in the form of NADH on the other side. That NADH is now in the matrix, and it can interact with the complex one that is also there. The other shuttle is the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. And what we're doing here is we are moving electrons to CoQ at complex 3. So that's one of the main differences between the malate aspartate shuttle and the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. 
is where your entry point is. We've got all the NADH that's made in the cytosol. One of those sources is NAD is glycolysis. There's cytosolic glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. And what we're doing there is taking dihydroxyacetone phosphate and we're converting that to glycerol 3 phosphate. That glycerol 3 phosphate can then be converted again back to dihydroxyacetone phosphate using mitochondrial glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. So cytosolic versus mitochondrial makes all the difference because the mitochondrial enzyme is where? Right there on the inner membrane. So it's a peripheral um, protein that's on the inner membrane space side, but it has access to CoQ, which is in that um, inner membrane. It can take in all of the electrons from FADH2, which is generated during catalysis, and shuttle them to complex three. So definitely be able to compare and contrast the two different shuttles. That could be a test question. With all of the important chemistry going on in the shuttling of electrons, maintaining this electrochemical potential, there must be some kind of regulation of oxidative phosphorylation. We're making a lot of ATP, which this should be a review here. All of the ATP from glycolysis, oxidation of pyruvate, and then acetyl-CoA via the citric acid cycle. We're making somewhere in the ballpark of 30 or 32 ATPs per molecule, molecule of glucose. Glycolysis, just under anaerobic conditions, where we're using lactate fermentation to recycle our NAD and NADH, gives us only two ATP. This is nothing in comparison to how much ATP is made using ATP synthase. Oxidative phosphorylation is regulated by energy needs, just like everything else. We're only going to talk about the acceptor control of respiration, which is ADP. There's some other regulation that's mentioned in your book that we're not really going to touch on. But acceptor control is pretty much saying if you don't have a substrate to accept the phosphate and therefore make ATP, then you're going to slow down the rate of oxygen consumption. If you don't have any ingredients, you can't really keep going forward with the recipe. It slows things down a bit. You have to go to the store, pick up that one thing that you forgot. Then you realize how difficult it was to find. And you ask three different people where it is and none of them know. And then you're about to give up. And then you realize that it was right there in the beginning of the store on an end cap. And you just kept walking by it because you thought it must be some kind of a major you know, goose hunt or something. Yes, that's happened to me before. Anyway, the rate of consumption of oxygen, meaning the flow of electrons through the electron transport chain, is totally dependent on the availability of ADP to actually condense with the inorganic phosphate to make ATP. There are other things that control it too, but we're gonna leave it there. So in terms of protein um, inhibitors, we're gonna talk about IF1. IF1 simultaneously binds to two ATP molecules. And it inhibits the activity, the enzyme activity in both directions. So it's a, it's a dimer, and it's only a dimer when it's active. And this happens when the pH 
is low. So six point less than 6.5. So we're talking acidic conditions. In hypoxic cells, you have acidic conditions, right? So if you're in a hypoxic state as a cell, you don't have very much oxygen. It makes sense that IF1 is going to be present and halt ATP synthesis because ATP synthesis involves the use of molecular oxygen. If we don't have very much oxygen, then splitting oxygen to make water and, you know, generating that proton motive force doesn't do anything good for the cell. So IF1 prevents a drastic drop in the ATP concentration. Instead of relying on this system that will eventually completely stop, we're at least going to slow it down some and use some other things to make ATP to fill in the gap. Hypoxia can actually lead to ROS production because we're slowing down the electron transport chain. If you're slowing it down because you don't have a lot of oxygen to transfer those electrons to, then you've got a lot of complexes and CoQ kind of stuck with electrons. We've got defenses against ROS, so the glutathione peroxidase system, which we already talked about that. Then there's also the regulation of pyruvate dehydrogenase. The phosphorylated complex is inactive, and hypoxia is one of the things that will trigger the uh, PDH kinase to phosphorylate it to reduce activity. There's also a modification of complex 4, one of the subunits gets swapped out. So there's COX-4-1 gets swapped out to COX-4-2. COX-4-2 is more efficient under hypoxic conditions. And then once those conditions are gone and the cell is happy again, it's got more oxygen, then the swap can happen to replace 4-2 with 4-1. There's also gene regulation. HIF1 is a hypoxia-inducible factor, and it accumulates in hypoxic cells. So if we are in a hypoxic state, we're going to increase the transcription of HIF1. So we're going to have a lot more of it on hand. In turn, we're going to increase the transcription of other enzymes and proteins. In general, we are going to turn on glucose transport so we're going to bring in more glucose from the blood and we're also going to make more glycolytic enzymes so all the enzymes involved in glycolysis we're going to crank those up in addition we're going to increase lactate dehydrogenase because we need a way to regenerate all the NAD we're making a lot of NADH by going through glycolysis we need NAD to keep going through glycolysis to make ATP. We're only getting two ATP from this process, so we need to hurry, 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 and crank through it. We need a way to get NAD back. Remember in our talk about uh, cancer cells and the Warburg effect, cancer cells are usually in a low energy state. They're hypoxic. And they use glycolysis to make the majority of their energy. So you're going to see HIF1 present in cancer cells as well. Now we've got all this glycolysis going. We're making a lot of pyruvate. And we want to make sure that we're making lactate, not acetyl-CoA. So we're going to inhibit PDH complex by increasing the PDH kinase. That's going to phosphorylate the complex and inactivate it. 
if we inactivate that, then we're also going to slow down the citric acid cycle. And we're going to slow down the respiratory chain because we're not making the same amount of NADH and FADH2. So we don't have electrons to transfer anymore. If we do that, then we're going to reduce the amount of ROS that we make, which is a good thing to protect the cell. In addition to the glycolytic enzymes and lactate dehydrogenase and all that, we also have the increase of a protease that degrades COX-4-1 that's part of the complex four. We're gonna have an increase in the production of COX-4-2. That subunit replaces COX-4-1 and enables complex four to operate in low oxygen conditions. This is another one that is regulation, you know, is like a great place to ask questions because you have to understand the system and you have to understand how it's related to all the other little systems that we've talked about. ATP and ADP, their relative concentrations control the rates of pretty much everything that we have covered so far, starting with chapter 14 all the way up to now electron transfer, oxidative phosphorylation, citric acid cycle, pyruvate oxidation, so the PDH complex, and glycolysis. You should be able to explain what would happen if you have high levels of ATP and what would happen if you have high levels of ADP, whether or not electron transport and all these other um, pathways are increased or decreased based on whether you have a high ATP or high ADP. So I would recommend that you do that as practice to make sure that you understand overall what happens. Then you can go and do the nitty gritty like what are the molecular mechanisms of this? Is it a kinase that's doing something? Is it a phosphorylase that's doing something? What's going on? This is a summary of all the ATP producing pathways that we've covered and their major steps that are regulated. So glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, all the ways that they are inhibited by these energy molecules. Great study slide, great slide to talk through to remind yourself of all the places that you can have regulation and what high concentration of ATP or ADP would do to all of these different processes. Now we're gonna step into talking about some of the other processes that occur in the mitochondria. The first is looking at brown adipose tissue in making heat. So brown adipose tissue is in newborn mammals, including humans. And this tissue generates heat to keep baby warm. Even if you don't have children yourself or you've never, you know, you don't have any nieces or nephews or anything like that, I think we can all agree that when babies are born, they're tiny. It's not rocket science. And a tiny baby needs a little help staying warm because they don't have all that body fat. But what they do have is a specific type of body fat, the brown adipose tissue, and that generates heat that keeps them warm. Eventually they get bigger, you don't really need to do that anymore. There's also the uncoupling protein one, UCP1. This is a SIM porter that gives an alternate path for protons to return to the matrix from the intermembrane space without actually passing through the ATP synthase. And the result of that is you're generating more energy, which is dissipated as heat that will help keep you warm. There's a third process where you can actually have a cycle of um, phosphocreatine being phosphorylated and then dephosphorylated. 
removing that phosphoryl group releases energy, which is dissipated as heat. And then there's the creatine kinase, which goes in, phosphorylates creatine once again. And you have this cycle that's generating energy to keep you warm. This slide just summarizes all that I said in the words before. So if you're a picture person, here it is. We've got the phosphocreatine thing going on here to create heat. And we talked about creatine kinase a little bit when we were talking about um, the transfer of um, that phosphoryl group. We drew it and also having this phosphocreatine, um, you know, buildup of it is a quick way to create ATP. So we've also got the UCP1, that uncoupled protein 1. It allows the flow of the protons back through to the matrix without having to um, increase your ATP production. Hibernating animals also take advantage of the brown adipose tissue, the bat, and that keeps them warm during their long periods of dormancy. We're not going to talk about steroid synthesis here. Um, we're going to skip over that. We haven't talked about fatty acids enough, really. So I feel like that discussion might be a little bit more difficult to have. But if you're interested in it, by all means, go ahead and read about it in your book. But you will not be tested on it. Mitochondria are actually central in the initiation of apoptosis, which is also called programmed cell death. This is the process where you have individual cells that die for the greater good of the organism. Now, if there's any Trekkies in the crowd, and I'm going to out myself, I like Star Trek. I never knew that I did. But then my husband was like, you got to watch Star Trek. And I was like, oh boy. So if I don't like this, then what? Thankfully, I liked it. We're still together. But there's a movie from the original crew where... Spock decides to sacrifice himself for the greater good of the crew in the ship. And there's this whole, you know, emotional moment where, you know, it's like, you'll always be my friend and, you know, tears, yada, yada. Turns out that Leonard Nimoy was planning on, you know, not doing any more movies ever again, ever. That didn't work out. He did more. So there was some real emotion in there. But that's what these individual cells do. They say, you will always be my friend. They put their hand on the glass and then they bid you farewell. This process can be triggered during normal embryonic development. So if you think about all of the things that develop that are then gone, like webbed fingers, the webbing between your fingers disappears. Those cells have to die. They don't just disappear. It can be triggered in response to an external signal. It could also be triggered by internal events. So DNA damage, viral infection, oxidative stress from the accumulation of all those reactive oxygen species, or even heat shock. So lots of things can happen to trigger cell death. Cytochrome C pops up in all this. You have some kind of stress or signal, or what have you, that triggers the permeability transition pore complex. And that opens up the membrane to make it more permeable. Cytochrome C moves from the inner membrane space to the cytosol. That's where it meets up with APAF1, apoptosis protease activating factor 1. Forms what's called the apoptosome. And that will activate procaspase 9. It causes them to dimerize and become active. And caspases are proteases. And there's this whole cascade where one cascade activates another, which activates another, and eventually that leads to cell death. So cytochrome C does more than just 
transfer electrons in the transport chain. It also is key in programmed cell death. Mitochondria are really cool because they actually have their own little genome. And there are, there's a theory about the evolution of the mitochondria. And of course, with something that's so important, there are mutations that have drastic effects on the whole organism. The mitochondrial genome is not very big in comparison to your nuclear genome anyway. 13 mitochondrial proteins are encoded by the genome and synthesized in the mitochondria. There's also a lot of tRNA and ribosomal RNA that are made in the mitochondria as well. A lot of mitochondrial proteins, about 1,200 of them, are actually encoded by nuclear genes. So they're made the way that all the other proteins are made, you know, if you think about the central dogma. And then they're imported into the mitochondria. This just gives you an idea of how many parts the mitochondria will make for itself versus how many it's importing into its own little country. Take, for example, complex one. There's 45 subunits of complex one. How many of them are actually encoded by mitochondrial DNA? Seven. So you need the combination of the nuclear genome and the mitochondrial genome to have functional mitochondria. But where did mitochondria come from? Because it's almost like its own little separate, you know, being inside of each cell. And that's because the theory is mitochondria actually arose from aerobic bacteria that entered into an endosymbiotic relationship with primitive eukaryotes. Eventually, those bacteria became mitochondria. Chances are that whole chemiosmotic mechanism that we see with the F-type ATP synthesis evolved before the emergence of eukaryotes. And that's backed by the fact that bacteria have the whole uh, proton motive force thing going and using that to drive rotation. So you have extracellular nutrients that are being taken up by the bacteria against a concentration gradient. And along with those nutrients, you're also bringing in protons. There's a rotary motion of the bacterial flagella that's driven by the transmembrane electrochemical potential. Does that sound familiar? So this motor is moving and allowing for protons to be pumped. I say pumped, but to pass back through and maintain this electrochemical potential. There's mitochondrial DNA, and it's exposed to a lot of reactive oxygen species simply by being in the mitochondria. There's also the fact that the replication system in the mitochondria for replicating its DNA is less effective than the nuclear system at correcting mistakes and managing damage. So there's DNA repair mechanisms that keep the integrity of the nuclear genome that are simply not as effective in mitochondria. Because of this, you can accumulate mutations over time. And it's thought that the accumulation of these mutations contributes to aging. Animals inherit pretty much all of their mitochondria from the female parent. So with all of the mitochondrial um, DNA linked diseases, they're generally linked to mom. And mom likely has the issue too. But the pool of mitochondria from cell to cell looks different, which I know sounds weird, 
but it's true. So there's what's called heteroplasmy and homoplasmy. Heteroplasmy means that there's different types of mitochondrial genomes within a cell. So there's tons and tons of mitochondria per cell because you need a lot of energy. But all those mitochondria are not exactly the same, or they may not be. If they are, that's called homoplasmy. All the mitochondrial genomes are the same. But it's more likely that you have heteroplasmy, which means that you've got some different pools of mitochondrial genomes. And when mitochondria go through fission and split, then you may replicate some um, genomes that have mutations and some that are wild type or pretty much don't have any mutations that are you know, deleterious to the organism. The number of copies of the mutations gives you a varying phenotype, meaning that the severity of the disease differs based on how many mutant mitochondria you have floating around that have this, you know, that exhibit whatever phenotype. Or they have the gene that contributes to the phenotype. So some mutations in the genome cause disease. Again, that's not rocket science. There's what's called mitochondrial encephalop. Mm, I always get this word wrong. Encephalomyopathies. I always put the emphasis on the wrong part the first time I say the word, literally every single time. Even if I say it right in my brain the first time, when it comes out of my mouth, my tongue says no. I have a PhD and I still struggle with some of these big words. So if you struggle too, it's really okay. Everyone does. It's just that some people practice and keep all the struggles hidden. I don't. We all struggle with something, but you can still do really well and accomplish your dreams. Anywho, enough encouragement. Back to the science. So there's a group of genetic diseases that primarily affect the brain and skeletal muscle. And they're inherited from the mother because most of the mitochondria come from mom. And the reason for that, which is talked about in your book, but pretty much sperm don't really have a whole lot of room for a whole lot anyway. They don't provide a whole lot of genetic material. And there's not a whole lot of mitochondria. On top of that, there are mechanisms which pretty much, you know, negate the mitochondria that are donated from the sperm and make it so that most of them don't actually make it to the growing organism. So there's that. There's called um, Lieber hereditary optic neuropathy, which is a rare disease that affects the central nervous system. And it's literally caused by a single amino acid substitution in complex one that causes electron transfer from NADHT ubiquinone to be defective. A single amino acid substitution. One, you, you remember how big that complex is. But if you have one single amino acid substitution, a particular one, that leads to a disease. Just think on that for a second. I think that's a mic drop moment. Like that's kind of one of the you know, facts of the lecture, in my mind, that something so large can be affected by literally one amino acid substitution. There's also Murph syndrome, myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fibers, and it's caused by a mutation in a gene that encodes the tRNA for lysine. So skeletal muscle fibers of affected people have abnormally shaped mitochondria, and sometimes they have the, these um, paracrystalline structures. There's a, a technique called mitochondrial donation, which raises some ethical issues. In my opinion, when it comes to ethics, Science does not answer that question. Science can provide knowledge. It can provide um, technology. It can provide techniques. But it doesn't answer the question of whether we should or shouldn't as a people. 
So I appreciate science for all that it does. I don't ask too much of it. I don't ask it to inform my ethics. So take this for what it's worth. Understand that this occurs. How you feel about it is personal and you can have your own feelings about it. That's totally fine. But we're looking at it here just to appreciate the knowledge that we have as a people to enable a process like this to happen. So I will step off of my soapbox and continue with the science. So mitochondrial donation means that you're taking a prospective mom's nuclear genes and putting that into an ovum that's had its nuclear, nuclear genes removed. That's called enucleated. And that comes from a donor who has healthy mitochondria. So say mom has some mitochondrial disease or there's a high likelihood that her offspring will have this, you know, some disease. And she wants to reproduce, but does not want to have an offspring with said disease, or at least wants to reduce the chances. Then you have a donor with healthy mitochondria that you inject mom's genes into, nuclear genes, to create um, an ovum that has no mutation, at least in terms of the mitochondrial um, genome, so that the offspring that's produced will be free of disease, at least in terms of mitochondrial diseases. Again, this raises some ethical issues. Should we, should we not, to be or not to be? Science doesn't answer that question but it provides technologies and methods and knowledge so that we can come together as a people and decide. There's also a rare form of diabetes that results from defects in the mitochondria that are in pancreatic beta cells. So the pancreas is responsible for insulin production, which is key in regulating blood sugar. If you have issues with beta cells, then you will likely have issues with regulating blood sugar. These defects actually limit ATP production even when glucose levels are high. And this eventually gives rise to a form of type 2 diabetes that is quite rare. If you'd like more information on that, again, you can look at your textbook. For all of these um, you know, diseases and things. I'm not requiring you to know these for the test, but I want you to just have an appreciation for all of the, all of the work that the mitochondria does and how changes or mutations can affect the entire organism. With that, thanks for watching. Make sure that you um, connect all of this information with chapter 16 which is on the citric acid cycle and then reach back even further to chapters 14 and 15 and make sure that the hormonal regulation and regulation by all of the energy molecules or the low energy molecules makes sense talk through it draw figures redraw figures make sure you understand the big picture that will make understanding the molecular picture, the smaller picture, the, the narrow focus make much more sense. Good luck with your studying. I'll see you soon, virtually of course. Stay safe.